Hello and welcome to another episode of Acting Prime Minister with me, Paul Brand. The podcast where we pick the PM and ask a different guest each week to imagine themselves behind that Downing Street door. And this week's guest has broken quite a bit of new ground as an MP, the first to hail from Palestine, the first to come out as pansexual. A maths and physics teacher before becoming a Lib Dem MP, now she only needs to count to 11 to check her parliamentary party are all present. Could she be the next woman to lead it? Leila Moran, welcome to Acting Prime Minister. Thank you for having me. This is a big day. <laughs> I'm the Prime Minister. How cool You that? are the Prime Minister for the next half an hour. Um, and thanks for having us here in your office, which you've only just inherited. Just got here. Um, and so a bit sparse uh, on the walls we have. I went to uh, the Netherlands with uh, my family recently. So we went to the Van Gogh Museum. And uh -huh. so I've got some cheapy prints of Van Gogh's on the wall. I've got an old Charles Kennedy poster from when he ran for leader, which somehow ended up in my office and I still don't know where that came from. And there are a few ghosts of leaders past in here because this was Tim Farron's office. This was Tim Farron's old office. And then across the way is Joe Swinson's office. That's right. That's right. So yeah, maybe, you know, there's sort of signs here. That's that... right. It's something in the air. Who yeah. knows? Who knows? Yeah. Um, and look, it's been an eventful week too, particularly for a Lib Dem. We have left the EU now. Do you feel any different now that we've left? I'm still bereft. I don't think I quite expected in the run up to that week how I would actually feel at 11 o'clock on that Friday. And as speaking to many of my colleagues and friends who'd campaigned for so long to stop Brexit, you know, a little bit Lib Dems are an internationalist party. My dad worked for the EU, you know, this is literally the first flag mm. I could ever draw was the EU flag. And so we go, we go through a period of grief after the referendum, but then you pick yourself up and start campaigning. And then it gets to that Friday. And it kind of felt like the day of a funeral, where obviously you knew why you were there, you knew the date, you had to kind of just get through the day. And it got to about 8 p.m. And I was at a big event in Oxford, literally over 500 people, all of us kind of feeling very similarly. And it was really hard to not just be super emotional. There were people crying in that room. And I think now we're through the other end of it. And it's about where we go from here. And for us, it has to be, you know, closest possible relationship. Keep the chink of light through the door there. But I really, I, I'm not at all convinced that we need to start talking about rejoining just yet. And that's definitely a conversation the party needs to have. But there's actually a lot of ground to cover over the next few months with the battles for the next agreement, because everyone, I think, thinks it's over. And it absolutely isn't. OK, well, look, let's look forward. And let's put you in Downing Street. Let's right. get you straight in there. Let's get you settled into that Downing Street study. Apart from your cheapy Van Gogh. Well, you know, prints, this is a thing. I as will... you called them. I... Me. <laughs> um, what's the first picture you think you'd put on the wall? Oh, so that's really hard. I mean, we really love to upgrade the prints to something <laughs> that was actually worthwhile. I understand that they have the most beautiful archive of things for you to choose from. And having never really seen what they've got, I think I would take some joy in having someone come to explain it to me. And I love going to art galleries and that kind of thing. So I think I don't, wouldn't necessarily know. I would like to see something from British artists. I think mm -hmm. that's really important. But you've got to be a bit careful because, you know, I love things like Francis Bacon, but I'm not sure I want one of his triptychs up there <laughs> behind me. They're just a bit garish. Um, so, yeah, we'll have to see. I haven't got one in mind, but okay. I love that. And I also love a bit of modern art. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll see. And what's the first drink you think you'd pour yourself to get yourself steady those nerves? Oh, I, you know, my go to is a glass of red wine. Okay. Um, and I'd love to say I'm picky, but I'm not actually that picky. <laughs> not a huge fan of the Merlot, but uh, yeah, one glass of red wine is ten after an election or a hard day. That tends to be what I have, and I'm getting better and better at keeping it to just the one. <laughs> okay, that's good, uh, because you need to be sober to make your first Indeed. phone call as well. Who do you think you'd want to call first? Yeah, well, undoubtedly, uh, and if we're, you know, it's this week, and so the big challenge that you face as PM now, in my view, is, is keeping, keeping the country on its economic tracks. And mm -hmm. we have a big deal that we have to do with the European Union. The European Union is one of the best strikers of trade deals in the world. That's what it's done for the whole of its life. And that's why we joined it, because we realized that that was, you had more bargaining power if you were together. We are now on the other side of that fence. And in order to strike a good deal, you actually have to have very positive relationships with other EU leaders. Uh, Macron and his party sit in the same group as us, or sat in the same group as us, 
in the European Parliament, uh, I think clearly he would have to be the first person I'd call, okay. followed closely by Angela Merkel. So French president first, German chancellor second. Indeed. And we'll get on to talking a bit more about the EU later, because as a Lib Dem, of course, it's something that you're going to want to focus on in Downing Street. But let's talk a bit about your path to power now as well, a bit about your background. So you grew up the daughter of a Palestinian mum and a British dad. Mm -hmm. And your father, as you've mentioned, was a diplomat for the EU. So you travelled the world a lot as a child, I believe, yep. moving from country to country. What was that kind of international childhood like? Yeah, so I never knew any difference. So I think it wasn't until I was an adult where people were, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> but we moved, um, I was born in Hammersmith actually, uh, and it was the only one of the brothers and sisters that was born in the UK, in fact. How many brothers and sisters I'm have you the got? eldest of four. Okay. Uh, so we moved to, e to Belgium, where dad got the job when I was one, and then when I was five we moved to Ethiopia. So this is in the late 80s, during a time of a, a dictator called Mengistu. And uh, a story not many people know is I learned to swim in the Hilton in Addis Ababa because we weren't allowed to move into the house that had been allocated to us because there were military parades outside every day while he was fighting the civil war with Eritrea. And I remember turning to my father at the time and asking him why this was happening. Why can't we move into our house and why can't we... Uh, what, why are they, they doing this? And he said something along the lines of, you know, some men need to show that they're powerful and this is why. And so my, a whole of my childhood, we then went on to Jamaica when I was 11, which was great, but, you know, very poor country, very interesting country. Jordan after that, which was fantastic. That's where my mother's family, when they left Jerusalem via Jericho, then left and ended up settling in Jordan. So that was when I really connected with my Palestinian roots. And then finally, they ended up actually in Egypt right after the revolution. So the whole of my childhood was actually littered with these, you know, huge world events or world mm. events that were really important to that country. But I saw them through a child's eyes and asked stupid questions and actually got some very, very interesting answers. Because it must be a very worldly childhood. You learn a lot about the world, but then also maybe a, a, bit, a bit unsettling. Very unsettling, know. very unsettling. And, you know, the hardest bit of all is you... You get very good at making friends very quickly, and there's a phenomenon for children like me. Uh, and it's not just children of diplomats, you also find it with army children as well. Uh, we're third culture kids, um, where actually the cultures that we grew up in are different to the cultures of our parents. And it means, on the one hand, it's very positive, we're very good at making friends, we understand the connectivity between people very quickly, put me in a new environment, and within a matter of days, I'm comfortable. Mm -hmm. However, the other side to it is that it is very, very unstable. And so that led to, you know, bullying when I was uh, at various schools, simply because I couldn't quite work out immediately how to fit in. Everyone else had grown up all together. And so you end up feeling a little bit like an outsider. Um, I fell behind in subjects simply because the order in which things are taught in different countries is different. And in particular, I remember I was in the bottom set for English, the bottom set for maths, almost everywhere I went just because I and then had to have extra help. So I was pulled out of classes because I couldn't, you know, add. Well, it wasn't adding. It was actually multiplying. And different countries have different symbols for multiplying. And I hadn't been taught which one was the one. Right. Turns out later, actually, I'm very good at maths. And I went on to do a phys <laughs> physics degree at Imperial. Um, and so I went mm. to boarding school when I was 13. Uh, and I was the only one of my family that did that. And it was for educational stability. And I'm, I'm glad that happened. But again, it was an example of, of you know, something I didn't really want to do. I was pulled away mm. from the family and I wish I wish I didn't have to, but I, I'm glad that I was given that opportunity. And as you say, you went on to study physics then at Imperial uh, College in London, and you've been quite open about the fact that you, you suffered depression while you were there too. Yeah. What was going on at that time in your life? Well, I think a number of different things. I mean, one, I had come from this uh, all girls environment in this lovely school, um, which, you know, was away from parents, was very much sort of standing up on my own two feet and the, the school itself was very progressive and we all did our own cooking and cleaning and, and all that stuff and was we were being told that you know you are strong women and can do anything um, and it wasn't so much that that wasn't happening it was just that I was at Imperial and physics I think we were five women maybe maybe a handful more but I didn't see too many in a class of nearly 300 and so there was an enormous disparity there um, I was also used to, by this point, you know, I did very well at GCSEs and A-levels and flew and uh, absolutely loved it when I finally found some, ed some educational mm. stability. We went to Imperial, which was very, very competitive. Right. And I really just struggled with 
that competitive nature that was, was there. Was it like, sort of like a match over Very much so, very much so. And um, so the combination of all of these things, plus, and I've spoken very openly about this before as well, I was obese. And uh, when I got to Imperial, you know, this is a time when I wanted to sort of be out and about in London and whatever, and actually that really kind of got on top of me. So the combination of all of these things made me very depressed. And that, of course, didn't help the obesity, and it got it really boomed under that. And so I spent a year uh, where I super struggled. And thank goodness for my mother, who, you know, when you are like that and you are going through an episode like that, mm. and I'd never been through one before, she said, you know, come and see someone with me. And I went to see a psychiatrist who said, well, you know, you're a perfectionist. And sometimes people who have that tendency, when they're not doing as well as they should, end up in a depression and that we need to work on some therapy for you. But also here, are, and he put me on Prozac, and so I was on Prozac for a year. Okay. And I think a lot of people don't talk about the fact that no. you know those drugs actually, for me, helped. But it was in tandem with doing it with doctors, with having talking therapies. And I'm very proud to have got through that career at a degree and then ended up with a good career in, in mm -hmm. physics teaching after that. But I had a lot of friends who didn't have that family support and actually didn't finish their degrees. And one of the things that I like to campaign on now is student mental health, because even now, with more and more people talking about mental health, there still isn't that provision in universities, I think, when people are going through a big transition in their lives to support them through it. And I'm lucky I had it, but everyone should. And do you think you're still a perfectionist now? I have curbed that tendency, mm -hmm. although Obviously, I want to do the best that I possibly can, but I think one of the good things about this job is that you do learn that sometimes the best can be the enemy of the good. And I mean, you can't be a perfectionist you can't, MT anyway, because you can't please everyone. You so. can't please it. Well, it's not so much about the pleasing, it's more about the pleasing yourself that's the problem. Mm. And you set yourself impossibly high standards and then you don't meet them. And actually, that's even worse than displeasing someone else. So I've learned to be kinder to myself. Okay and kinder to everybody. Good and advice. it's uh, not that I don't drive myself or want to do good things, but actually when something falls, the first instinct isn't, you are bad, why has this happened? Actually, the first instinct should be, why did this happen? How can we make it better? And it's just switching that on its head. Mm -hmm. And I think it makes you more successful overall. Okay, good advice. Um, and I think more than perhaps any MP other than Boris Johnson, your love life has been in the, <laughs> in, in the papers. Not and, quite in the same way, no, I should not say. not in the same way. There's no scandal here. There's no scandal no. here. But you did this year come out as pansexual. Yeah. So let's just start by talking about what that means to you. What does pansexual mean to you? Yeah. So, I mean, the story was that I, I've been with guys all my life before. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't so much that I had not known this or anything like it just wasn't I think there just wasn't that sort of opportunity and uh, I fell in love with a woman who I met through work and that was a bit of surprise to me it was definitely a surprise to my family and the pansexual label is one that I kind of chose because I knew at some point people are going to ask about it and actually the first time I spoke to my mum about it I'd identified as bi but then I realized actually there's other terms here that I could explore and when you are going through this as an adult anyway, and I'm sure it's the same for anyone at any age, but you sort of, you try these different things on for size as mm -hmm. you're you checking against your identity. And it really feels like putting on different coats and which one fits best. And so pansexual, for me, and there's actually several definitions of all of these things, but for me, what the reason it's pansexual is that it's very much about the person. Okay. So it's not about the fact that they are a woman or a man. It's not, even, it's not about anything that's a physical attribute of the person. It's about the person inside and whether or not you click and if you work as a couple. And I think that's why it made the news because most people hadn't heard what this no, term it was. was it was an education for a lot yeah. of people, I think, the word pansexual. And how did you end up in that situation? So you, you, you fall in love with someone and it must have been a surprise to you that they just yeah. happened to be a woman. Yeah, exactly that, as you, as you do. You, you, you work people? closely with because they work for the Lib Dems. That's and right, we, yeah. Let's not bring their their name into it because obviously they've got their own um, privacy to protect. But mm. you're working closely with someone, and what you just develop a relationship. You become and friends, and it's like it's like any workplace romance. You just sort of you work together, then you become friends, and then it becomes more. And so actually, there was nothing odd about it in a mm. funny way. It's a very common story, and I think the reason why it became a story was simply that I probably chose this label, but just fit well for me. 
And some people afterwards have said, oh, you only did it to further your career or to get there. Actually, it wasn't like that at all. It was just that this term happened to be something that I identified with. Because yeah, some people sort of raised a few eyebrows and said, oh, you know, the woke The culture. woke generation. Taylor Brown's yeah. just trying to be more woke than the other Lib Dems. Yeah, but... no, that was not it at all. And actually, to be perfectly frank, the reason why it happened was because there were some journalists who felt that this was a salacious story and needed telling. And I would have much preferred keeping that part of my private life to myself. The best reaction that I've had from almost everyone is that we don't care. <laughs> and I love it. And occasionally it would, it would come up on a radio phone in or something and someone would go, I just don't care. Why can you not keep your private life to yourself? I'm like, I agree. <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> no more talking about my private life. I mean, someone who might care, I suppose, to be a little bit cheeky about it is Tim Farron. Do you think that he thinks uh, you're a sinner now? Not at all. Not okay. at all. And in fact, Tim knew before any of this happened and is very supportive. OK. All right. Good. Um, let's get back to you being prime minister now and talk about your cabinet because you need to appoint one. Mm. Firstly, though, let's have a bit of fun and see who you might sack from the cabinet. Is there someone you'd just be like, right, you are number one, you're getting sacked from the current cabinet? Uh, well, Dominic Raab, I have to say, is probably one, mm. simply because Why? Isha and Walton... He's been on this podcast. Isha, so. Isha and Walton in the last election was obviously, you know, one of those seats that Lib Dem voted... Lib Dem target voted majorly to remain. And um, Monica Harding, our candidate there, was absolutely brilliant. And they ran a superb campaign. And I watched some hustings where I could see the dynamic between them and I just don't think he was he was particularly nice. Um, and so just for that reason alone, because I wanted my mate Monica to win, but also I think he could have been slightly more gracious at points. Um, Dominic, I think. But okay. Boris Johnson, I ain't no fan either. So I'd probably start there. But then if I've got already, his job, yeah, yeah, I've got his job. So he's already gone. Exactly. So that's all right. And who would you love to appoint to the cabinet on the more positive side? Well, I mean, you know, one of the advantages of having 11 Lib Dems is that they can all come. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> so you, need they can 11, all... you need about 11 more, though. So That's right. Um, <laughs> lords? And, well, Lib, indeed. Lib and lords. We've, got, we've got some absolutely brilliant lords. And, you know, Shirley Williams, in fact, yeah. very early on, well before I was interested in politics. And it's, it's worth saying, all through my physics degree, all through my childhood, I had absolutely no interest in politics whatsoever. Uh, I became a teacher because I wanted to help people, but actually I just absolutely did not want anything to do with anything remotely to do with my dad's job or anything like that. And so it came to me very late. But Shirley Williams was one who I remember as a child impressed mm. me and I thought she had this enormous grace about her. You know, clearly this sharp mind, but also a way of you know, reaching out and being really human with it. Mm. And so I often... And if anyone doesn't know who she is, she was Education Secretary. She was a member of the Labour Party. She and was... then she left to join the SDP. That's right. Which ultimately sort of became the Lib Dems. That's one right. One of a slightly more detailed explanation. That's right. Um, and she set up comprehensive school, I think, Shirley Williams. She did, so... absolutely, absolutely. And actually, that's one of the, you know, that kind of education equality is one of the things that I really champion, which, I mean, having gone to a posh boarding school, you'd think, well, what? But it's because I, it never even occurred to me until my 20s that in this country we didn't all just have brilliant education. We should. And I'd been to poor countries. I'd lived in places that had an excuse for why we weren't properly funding schools and having the world-class education system we deserve. And so I became an MP because I saw that we weren't doing that because I had just assumed a country like this would. And that made me really angry. And this was during my master's in comparative education. And that was the moment that I became politicized. But it was really small p. It was, I want to change this big thing. Mm -hmm. And then when it came to choosing a party, I actually did a really geeky thing. And you read I, up on the parties. <laughs> not just that. I read up on each party's education policy and compared it to what the research that I was doing was saying is what we should do okay. in order to create a world class system. And I said, I'm going to join the party that's closest and took a big gulp when I looked at the Tory website because dad would have absolutely killed me if I'd become <laughs> a Tory. And frankly, they were nowhere near. So it was fine. The Lib Dems were the, absolutely the closest, but nowhere near close enough. And the first thing I did when I went to my first Lib Dem conference was actually speak against our policy because my view was that it was getting there, but not quite close enough. And that remains my driving force. And I'm, that's why I'm education spokesperson. And that yeah. is why I'm here, is to give every child the opportunities they deserve. A couple of other names, if you want to. A couple of other Well, I know you've told me in the past that David Attenborough is right up there for education. Uh, no, education. Environment. Uh, environment. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think Greta Thunberg would be a good spad. 
So let's get her in <laughs> and let's have her advise us as well. Um, and then, you know, I'm thinking across to, you know, who are some, we need some sort of out there thinkers. And I really appreciate, you know, people like Hugh Grant who have stood up okay, yeah. during the last referendum and did, went out there and started campaigning. I'd love to have him around the table. I think he says Maybe it how culture, it is. Media and sport. Exactly. And culture, media and sport. Again, he can have a junior minister in Gar Gary Lineker. I think that would work really well as a, as a dynamic. A cabinet of Remainers, though, probably. I mean, well, we don't know where Greta is on well, all this, but I'd imagine she's a Remainer. I would imagine so. But yeah, no, there is an issue with we do need to as a You're going to have to appoint a Brexiteer to unite the country. We are. Well, do I? <laughs> well, you don't have to, but well, if you did have to. If I did have to. And I think actually... Who's, who's the one you'd sort of... Who's the least worst option for you as a Brexiteer? Well, I, I've already discarded some of those labels in my own head now. And there are people in the House, many of whom, you know, voted through the withdrawal agreement and were maybe ambivalent over the course of the referendum, but now are fully behind this plan, who I have a huge amount of respect for. And in reality, as Lib Dems, we need to look at how do we work cross party. Mm -hmm. So I'm not thinking in terms of Remainers or Leavers at the moment. And actually, I do think there is a real issue for our party for how we don't just reach into that Remainer uh, category. Mm -hmm. Actually, we need to look at what are the core values that unite everybody. And that's actually how I approach the whole of my life. And that needs to include Brexiteers. But I think the reason why I'm pushing back against you a bit is that you're asking me to do it with that in mind. And that's a label sure. that lives with them forever. And actually, I think actually this is we need to push those away. I think all no of us now. No, no more Brexiteers. No more Remainers. No more Brexiteers. Let's talk about internationalism. Let's talk about those values. But I'm not necessarily certain that that just maps directly onto okay. those two tribes. Okay. Well, look, at, on your desk as Prime Minister, there will be some urgent issues. And of course, one of them is going to be Brexit because yeah. you'd be heading up the trade talks. We talked about this a little bit earlier. But I mean, what would your strategy be? So you're saying you wouldn't want to rejoin. So what would a, what would a Lib Dem Prime Minister be pushing for? Yeah, well, I think we have to... Where, where, where we are now is in a very divided country that has been through years of turmoil. And the reason why I don't think I would go immediately to rejoin now, even if I were prime minister, is that actually there's a huge amount of work still to do in convincing the whole of the country that that is where we want to go as a country. And I think we need to do it together. So my view is that you remain as close as you possibly can as in you stay in the single market, you stay in the customs union. That's going to upset some people who feel that that's not Brexit. But actually, when you remember the original referendum, I think that's what probably should have happened afterwards. You know, that was kind of that middle ground. Mm. But with one eye to as soon as the country felt that it wanted to rejoin, giving them that option. And I think it's going to take some time for parts of the country to feel that way. Um, and it will take some time, particularly for the younger people who care deeply about this, who are losing things like Erasmus and other programmes, for them to come back and say that that's what you know, they desperately want to do. So would that be a referendum at that point then, to rejoin? Probably, at yeah. some point. And it's really hard to say when we could do that, because I just don't think it, need, it ha can be this year, mm -hmm. after everything that's happened. But we need to keep that door open. So do you think it could happen maybe in the next couple of years though, not necessarily this year, but within this parliament? It's impossible say to is... say. The one time, I would say probably not. And I think we're probably talking a generation actually. But if they don't strike a deal, no deal is on this table as an option because we didn't successfully rule it out as a parliament. And actually probably the first thing I would do is legislate for that because we absolutely have to avoid no deal. No deal would be catastrophic. And Boris Johnson right now, and has said in the news in the last few days that that is still an option. They're calling it a Australia-style free trade agreement, which is it means no deal. nonsense. It means it's no, no deal. deal. And mm. so actually we need to get rid of that as an option. Mm. Okay, well, let's talk a bit about what happened to the Lib Dems as well, because at the moment it seems quite fanciful to imagine a Lib Dem. Well, that's it. And this conversation is quite hard because I keep having to remember I'm Prime Minister. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what do you think, you know, if you had to sum it up in a paragraph, what do you think went wrong for the Lib Dems in 2019? Well, first of all, I think we need to remember we actually did quite well in some measures. So we increased our national vote share by 4%. And yet we went down a seat in the Houses of Parliament and that just reignites one of the reasons that I'm 
so proud to be a Lib Dems because we talk so much about electoral reform mm. and how the system right now does not reflect people's votes. Over, I think, 1.3 million more people voted Lib Dem in this election. And yet the narrative is that we failed. I think it's the expectation was so high. Though, yes. Like, so there's partly. two things there. So actually, I, I agree with that. So empirically, we did better mm -hmm. on those measures. We did worse in terms of how we managed to convert that into seats. But where we spectacularly failed is, you know, first rule of politics is manage people's expectations. And I, whilst at the very beginning of the election, it was theoretically possible that in a four-way split, we could sort of come through the middle and take hundreds of seats. And that was where we were right at the beginning. And it was kind of like, what, if all of these things go right, that was theoretically possible. In a way, frankly, that it even wasn't in 2010. You know, mm -hmm. the, these things were not possible then because there was definitely only three parties. And then the Brexit party stood down. And that sent that clear signal to the Leavers to coalesce around Boris Johnson. Yeah. And meanwhile, the progressive parties, you know, we had Unite to Remain, which was great, but that Labour Party were not willing to be part of that conversation. And Corbyn was a huge, huge issue on the doorsteps for us, particularly among people who would normally vote Conservative, would never consider Labour, but that was such a push that when it came to those seats where it was us versus the Tories, could they face a Labour government and a Corbyn-led Labour government? And for those people, it was just a no. Mm -hmm. So expectation management, very bad. Do you think it was a mistake then for Joe Swinson to say, I might be prime minister? Because that's what she was saying at the start of the, yeah. the election campaign. Bluntly, yes, I do think that was a mistake. And the reason that was a mistake wasn't that she couldn't have done a brilliant job and you know that she was anything other than absolutely capable of that role. That's for sure. And you need to put your first foot forward. But I think that combined with the high numbers of seats that we were predicting that made us look actually a bit hubristic, combined with revoke that was seen as arrogant because of the way that we had explained it. My view of revoke, incidentally, was that was always the logical next step to winning a people's vote. If we're the party of stop Brexit, you do that by revoking Article 50. It's mm. kind of entirely logically consistent. But the problem with all those three things together is that I think it made the party look arrogant and it made us look like we were. And it was coming on doorsteps and I think other people were feeding it. But that, you know, where do you stand on that on that sort of democratic deficit bit? So I do think there were mistakes that were made. Um, that said, I'm not sure that I can absolve myself from those mistakes either, because I was in some of those rooms when they were discussed. And it, there is a bigger question that we need to ask ourselves of the party is two things. Who are we in terms of our electorate? And do, are we just comfortable talking to a small number of people who are generally from affluent middle classes, generally well educated? Or are we more comfortable talking to the whole of the country, including places in the southwest and the north and in Scotland and places like that? Wales, you know, those are, they're now classed as leave areas. Actually, no, what are the values that we all have in common? We need mm. to start talking to all of them. And I think some of that in the strategy of the election was forgotten. And I think that was strategically a big mistake. And as a result, those voices weren't in those rooms. Those dissenting voices from other parts of the country weren't in the rooms. They, there was no one going, hello, this is a really bad idea. There were a couple of people whispering it, but it wasn't loud. And so there's another issue in our party, I think, about how we make decisions. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure we've got the diversity of views in the room. And that's not just in terms of race and color and uh, you know, background and all the rest of it. It's also about where they are in the country and what their life experiences is. It sounds as though you thought about this very carefully. Do you want to be leader? <laughs> I have thought about it carefully. I think you will find that most Lib Dems right now have been doing some deep dive navel gazing over this stuff because this should have been an election where we massively surged forward and unfortunately it just didn't happen. We're doing a general election review right now and so we are all thinking about this. And to the job of leader, I've been really open in the past even that it is a job that I would consider, but I'm definitely not at the point where I'm ready to say that I'm definitely going to do it because I personally think that it is one thing to say that it's a job I could do which is probably where I am, but it's quite another to say, but I know what I'm going to do with it. And we've had four leaders in as many years. This party now needs stability. 
probably whoever is the next leader will be here for not just one but two elections. We've got a run-up of four years until the next one. And what is that strategic direction that we need to go in as a party? Am I the answer to that question? And actually, personally, I want to know I have that answer before I say and do anything. Because if you don't, I think it's the wrong decision, not just for the party, but also for whoever takes that on. So I'm not there yet, but there's a lot of work still to be done. So you're not ruling yourself out. You, you could no. be there because you've got a while to go. It's, the race isn't really going to properly Indeed. get off until the summer. Indeed. So you, at this stage, maybe you're thinking about it and yeah. you might be ready by the summer. I might be ready by the summer. Indeed. And, and this is one of the good things, I think, about the slightly longer timetable is that I and other people who have suggested that they might also be thinking about it can take our time over these questions. And I will say this, if I run, it's because I have that answer and I, that's the platform that I will be running on. It's the where do we want to be in a generation answer. And if I don't have that answer, I think it's incumbent of me to not stand. Okay. Well, look, you are Prime Minister now. You just won a general election. Well, that's it. I've not just stood. I've won. This. And it was and great. We, yeah, we keep, we keep forgetting <laughs> that you are in Downing Street. So let's finish off with some quick fire questions okay. about how you might behave as Prime Minister. Um, firstly, who would you have round for dinner first, Nick Clegg or Joe Swinson? Oh, can I have both at the same time? No, sorry. Well, honestly, Joe would be faster because she lives in London, I think. So, yeah, let's have Joe first. OK. Um, and what would keep you awake at night more as Prime Minister, climate change or Brexit? Oh, climate change, 100%, big time. And this whole election was like that. It's like you wanted to talk about the big issues. I mean, mm. climate change, just on that. I was The last parliament was caught up by Brexit and it was the Fridays for Future strikes that made me call the first debate on climate change on the floor of the house in two and a half years. And I just found that bizarre that I had to do that. So we now need, I think, every single department to be a climate change department. We need to reinstate that, that department in of itself. But I would like to set every single minister round my cabinet table the challenge of how do they greenify their department? How does every policy that they make make this country more mm. green. It's not just one person who does it, it's everyone who does it. What's the one thing that you couldn't do without in Downing Street? Oh, a cat. Okay. I'm a big cat person. I love my cat at home. How many they cats have you got? Just the one, okay. just the one. But I've had her since my university, so she's getting quite old oh, now, she I have must to say. Be very old. She's very old. What do not you that say? it's been that What old. are you saying? Yeah. <laughs> I just mean that you're very <laughs> developed in your political thinking. Well, so. no, 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 thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, no, she's, yes, indeed. So she's, she's, I love her very much, but uh, they don't like to move, so she's not coming with me. And Larry's fantastic, so I would love Larry to stay, and there is always a place on my lap for Larry. Where would you go on holiday as Prime Minister? Um, I have no idea. There are some Where do you beautiful. Like going? I mean, you've I love... been to so many places in the world already, I suppose. Well, that's it. And actually, I, I love traveling around the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And uh, mainly because when we had summer holidays as a kid, it was often to somewhere close by, but we were living in a really exotic place. So it was sure. somewhere else. So actually, I love going on holiday, places like, you know, I know Cornwall was a well rehearsed one, but actually, places that I know slightly less, mm -hmm. you know, the outer bits of Scotland, for yeah, example. Yeah. I would, I'm would. i dying to go visit my colleague Alistair Carmichael's seat. Yeah. Because <laughs> it takes two planes to get it, there. Two planes to get there. It's actually closer to Norway than it Orkley, is to London. Yeah, yeah. To, to Norway than it is to London. He genuinely puts, when they ask you in the house, what's your closest train station? For him, <laughs> it is somewhere in Norway than <laughs> Inverness. So <laughs> I would love to go there. Okay, and what's the song you'd dance to at party conference, you think? Oh, very good. Um, I'm, I love rock music, uh -huh. and so, you know, I, I, anything that's like that. Living on a Prayer is a good one by Bon Jovi, bit of, bit of 90s rock there. Nice. Um, but we did Lib Dem Disco, and actually I... I oh, yeah, Lib Dem Disco is quite a thing at party conference. It's a big thing. I didn't win because I went with my heart and not just the crowd pleasers, but I went 90s house. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Rhythm is a dancer, those oh. kinds of things. Brilliant. <laughs> you can't go wrong with that. <laughs> um, and lastly, would you ever want to be Prime Minister? When you think about what's involved in the job, is it something that you'd like to do, do you think? It's a really hard question to answer because, realistically, <laughs> it's probably not going to happen. But that said, I became a Lib Dem MP because I do want to see a Liberal Democrat government. And mm. that is what I'm here to try and deliver. And it will probably not be in my time, but it may well happen. And so if I were the leader at the time that that happened, then of course the answer is yes, because I want to spend my time pushing for Liberal Democrat values in our country. And it's 
frankly, time that we had a go. Because I'm not convinced the other the others have made a good a good show of it in my lifetime. Well, who knows? If you do become a leader, maybe you'll be going for Downing Street. <laughs> Lena Moran, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.